Thanks for downloading the second of our two episodes of the C-Suite podcast that we're recording in partnership with Banking Circle at Money 2020 Europe, taking place in Amsterdam. Uh, we're on the Banking Circle booth here at the event, uh, so it may get a bit noisy at times. I'm going to be chatting to a number of the speakers at the conference, and we hope that through these short conversations, we'll be able to provide you with a real flavor and understanding of the topics and issues being discussed here today. So next to join me is uh, Kahina Van Dyke, Global Head Digital Channels and Data Analytics at Standard Chartered. Um, Kahina, first of all, well done, because I understand you've literally just flown in today from New York. So. I have. I'm fresh. I'm fresh from sleeping on the plane and fresh from the stage of Money 2020. Yeah, and, and you've already done a session today. So yeah. let, let's let's talk about that. The, 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 the talk uh, was on the rise of fintech transforming the next generation of banking. How did it go? What were the key points that you spoke about? You know, it, this is one of my favorite topics, transformation, because it's actually what drives me to be doing what I'm doing, which is the fact that we are in a constant state of change, but right now, it feels like there's a collection of forces that are really accelerating transformation, and it's coming from the fintechs, and it's coming from the banks, and it's coming from data science and analytics and blockchain and all of these convergences, um, and it's just a really exciting time. I've been in this industry, parts of this industry, industry for 25 years and I think this is the most exciting time. And what about in terms of now, are there any specific challenges that you, you see you know, for the industry and, and if so, how are they going to be overcome? Yeah, I think people are getting very tied into the lines and the boundaries of what is a bank, banking versus fintech, right? Every single bank in the world is a fintech company. And if they don't realize they're a fintech company, they probably won't be a bank in 10 years. I mean, technology is driving what we're delivering in financial services. Technology is digital, it's data, it's user experience. You know, the real time nature of how do we make decisions? How do we onboard customers? How do we serve customers? Everything is changing. That's on the banking side. Every bank is a fintech. On the fintech side, 10 years ago, people thought these were really cute experiments. Well, those cute experiments are literally market movers now. Those cute experiments are $10 billion, $20 billion valuation companies that have a responsibility in a new ways that they really didn't prepare for. And the regulators are now looking at them and saying, wait, do you have compliance? Do you have KYC? Do you have AML? You know, what are your algorithms? How do you identify risk and, and make sure that you have liquidity? All those boring banking things, right? That they didn't even really think about when they started out. So it's a really interesting time because the, the boundaries in our head of what a banker looks like, what does a FinTech you know, founder look like? He wears sneakers and a t-shirt. Everybody is in financial services and all financial services is fintech. So it's just, I find it really fascinating how people are trying to pit the two against each other when actually they're converging. Now you, you mentioned you know, new technologies, new ways of doing things. Um, I want to ask you about um, Sandbox. So this, now this is an, a, a partnership that you've recently announced and, and it's to create metaverse experiences. This is something I'm really excited to hear about. Tell us about that. Well, listen, I, I am very cautious of buzzwords, only because the metaverse is really interesting, but it's really nascent, mm -hmm. right? Quantum computing has the opportunity to change everything we know about blockchain, and we're still just figuring out how blockchain is going to roll out at scale. So I actually think that, you know, that the experimentation is a perfect example of partnering with a fintech to learn something that banks don't traditionally wouldn't lean into and don't have the talent to lean into. So the metaverse is an area you have to be innovating. You have to be trying new things. And that's where a bank and a fintech partnership can be really interesting. But I think you have, the, in, in the same vein, you have areas like blockchain and DLT that are now ready for scalability in the institutional world, where three years ago, four years ago, nobody really on the corporate side was looking at how can digital assets actually create more liquidity in the financial markets? Not just trading crypto, guys. We're talking about blockchain as a platform. Um, and so the banks have been spending time and the institutions have been spending time, but the metaverse is a perfect example. And nobody, until, you know, you can credit, you know, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg talking about the metaverse has made it like top of everybody's yeah. mind. What does that actually mean though for banking? Undetermined at this time. Well, I was going to want, I mean, did, can you see how big a, an opportunity it's no. going to be for the sector or not? No. It's impossible to I say. can't. Yeah. I, it's too early. Yeah. It's kind of like when you ask me about blockchain, somebody was talking to me about crypto 10 years ago. 
and I was on one of these money stages, right? And they're like, well, what do you think is going to happen with crypto? And I was like, Bitcoin. It wasn't crypto. They called it, it was just Bitcoin. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, the government's not going to release like their control of currencies, right? It was like unfathomable about what was going to happen. But the reality is, is trial and error, people kept investing in it, people kept working on use cases, regulators got comfortable with it, and we're now in a completely different space. When I was at Ripple three years ago, you know, the regulators, I was traveling around the world talking to regulators, most of the regulators didn't even want to meet with you. Now they're regulating and saying this is part of the financial system. And the same thing with the metaverse. We're just going to have to lean into it and try a lot of things and fail and figure out what sticks. We've t touched on a number of technologies. Are, are there other ways that technology will shape you know, the future of, uh, of banking and financial services, do you think? Technology is going to, to lead financial services. Digital, listen, the new building blocks of a financial services company, artificial intelligence, blockchain, big data, cloud, um, you know, all of these areas that traditionally have not been part of banking are now going to be required to compete and be successful and deliver clients real-time solutions. So with that being said, technology is going to lead us, but technology needs operators. It needs people who understand the tools. So if you think about it, when I started in banking, I'm going to age myself, I had a calculator on my desk. That was a tool, the calculator, yeah. never, nobody said, oh, the calculator is going to lead banking, but you needed a calculator to do banking. Yeah. Then we moved to Excel. It was like, oh, okay. Nobody thought Excel was going to lead banking. It was a tool for operators who were fluent in Excel to make faster, better decisions. As the machines get better, human beings can be smarter. But what we have to do is we have to not believe that this is about technology. Technology is a tool for human beings who are creative, who are in environments where they're allowed to innovate and fail. You cannot be creative without failure. It's trial and error. It goes against the traditional certainty of banking, right? Banks like certainty, they want it predictability. And all of a sudden we're moving into this world where predictability is not promised, where people can have an artificial sense of precision about what's going to happen in two or three years. But the reality is a bunch of smart people leaning in in safe ways and adapting as new information comes. That is the cultural shift and the mind shift that has to happen to really embrace the future. And what the future is going to bring, it depends on how many smart people are going to be in that room. Fantastic. Um, while we've got you here, any other projects, initiatives that uh, we should know about that Standard Chartered are working on? I mean, listen, we are working on trying to be the largest fintech in emerging markets. What does that mean? We need a platform that is reliable, scalable, um, and delivers the same set of solutions to a client in Rwanda that we have to a client in Hong Kong. That's what we're trying to do. And the great thing about Standard Chartered and why I came to Standard Chartered is because we're in 50 countries. There's no other bank that serves as many countries, and especially the small countries, who really need these tools. They really need digital and data and easy solutions because people are trying to buy houses. People are trying to start businesses. Governments are trying to build bridges and develop their countries. And we need to be there, show up. And let's not forget the word financial services. We're supposed to be in service to people and markets and economies. And, and that's what we really need to focus on. Kahina Van Dyke, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, it was fun. We're here with Jakob Pethik, uh, Chief Commercial Officer of Uland. Um, Jakob, we've heard a lot about embedded finance here today. Just tell us a little bit about what actually is embedded finance and also why should our listeners and, and everyone that's, who's here, what, why should they be interested in it? Of course. Um, embedded finance is a buzzword you'll hear a lot. Um, to me, embedded finance is um, a trend that we're seeing where applications, software providers are embedding financial services and finance in particular into that application. So. For example, in the e-commerce space, you see companies like Amazon, like Shopify, like eBay, offering financing um, at the point where buyers and sellers need it. Um, you also see it in the EPOS space, where companies like Toast, for example, will be providing financing. So, in general, embedded finance refer to this trend where finance is put into other applications. Would you say it's, um, you know, specifically relevant at the moment, given the, you know the current economic climate? I mean, there's talk that we're you know, going into a you know, potential uh, recession at the moment, so... Yeah, it's a tough environment at the moment. Rising inflation, supply chain disruption, rising rates, and I think embedded finance can be a, a real driver for good in, in that case. You typically see small businesses struggle with working capital um, and traditional providers pulling away from providing that capital. 
embedded finance providers, they often take a broader view of the customer. They don't just care about making money on the loans they're issuing. They care about keeping their customers alive, thriving. And I think a lot of the embedded finance providers we see today will help small business access finance in, in a time of need. So absolutely. Um, I think more broadly, it reflects this trend that um, a lot of the companies that are offering financing today care just about more than the financing, and I think in the long run that'll be good for the small businesses. And, and do you do you see you know measurable benefits for those businesses and the merchants themselves? Absolutely. So the enterprises that offer embedded finance, they tend to want to keep their customers on their platforms. So we see churn um, half roughly. We tend to see the underlying businesses grow a lot as well. So we tend to see them grow 20, 30 percent faster in the, the six months after they obtain financing. The small businesses that access finance are often excluded by traditional institutions, and being able to access some form of growth capital can really help them take off. Right, and it's getting louder here, so we're going to we're going to wrap up, um, you know, with a final question. But w what are some of the the kind of more interesting industries um, where you've seen embedded finance used? Historically, embedded finance has been provided by payment companies and e-commerce platforms in particular. Um, we are shortly about to announce a partnership with a food delivery company who uh, help takeaway companies deliver food. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot more of these vertical specific applications of embedded finance where a company who understands their end customer is seeking to also offer financial services. Uh, Jakob uh, Pethik, thanks for uh, joining us. It was a pleasure. So I'm here with uh, Jana Dimitrova, CEO of OpenPaid. Um, Jana, let's start with a quick introduction to the company. Russell, great to be here. Thank you for having me. OpenPaid is a banking as a service provider. We are a provider of infrastructure for anyone that wants to build embedded finance to grow their business. Now, I know you've had a, a particularly busy day. You spoke at a session earlier um, about API quality in open finance and banking. Tell us a little bit about that session and what were the key takeaways? Yes, indeed, absolutely fascinating session. I'm surprised that uh, the audience wasn't asleep by the end of it. Um, a, a very technical topic on the face of it, but actually very important for the development of the industry because if you think about it, ultimately businesses are not interested in the infrastructure, businesses are not interested in uh, the pipes that power whatever financial solutions are they're using. They're ultimately interested in growing their customer base and delivering better customer experience. Uh, but in reality the only way to do that is uh, by ensuring that there is a level playing field and that there is interoperability amongst the different systems that are connected to one another to complete a full transactional cycle. So there was a, a very healthy debate, I think, on the panel about the benefits of standardization and whether standardizing APIs is killing innovation, whether it's killing that last mile that is really making, making the difference. I think in the end we all agreed, disagree on the topic, uh, and we all agree that uh, a, a healthy level of regulatory standards are required so that we can achieve a minimum level of system operability, interoperability, ideally to have that on a global scale, not just in regions, whether it's in Europe or, or the MENA region. And then from there onwards, I guess we all agree that the last mile of innovation, the proprietary development, the proprietary APIs are what really makes a difference for the user experience and ultimately for generating value for the uh, the end customer. Now I understand that uh, the C-Suite podcast has had a bit of competition today because you've been doing your own interviews here at Money 2020. What, what have you learned from all those conversations that you've had? You know, the event this year is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I met so many partners, so many friends, so many former colleagues from the industry. And frankly, it's great to see that uh, the industry is evolving. I think we're moving more and more into an interconnected ecosystem. And as the economy is demanding more and more fully integrated solutions uh, to be able to grow faster, I think we as the industry are really forced to uh, work ever more closely together. So I think there are a few overarching themes. Obviously, open banking is still very topical and the applications of open banking and how to actually generate 
value out of the standards set by the open banking legislation, um, embedded finance and whether we are going to see embedded finance really take off is another big topic that, that, that people think about. And of course crypto and uh, the, current, the current market conditions. But I'd say a very, very healthy mix of innovation um, and partnership as well. Yeah, I think embedded finance has definitely been the key topic uh, for us today, certainly in the conversations we've had. Um, yeah, so I certainly agree with you on that one. Um, now, one of the things that I know you've uh, announced here uh, today um, is this partnership with Yapley. T tell us a little bit about that, how it came about, and what was the thinking behind it? Uh, very happy to. So we're we're very proud to be selected by Yapili as their, uh, I guess, exclusive provider of uh, embedded financial solutions. Um, you mentioned that this is a, a hot topic, has been a hot topic for you during the day. I think this is a prime example and illustration of the power of embedded finance. Um, we are uh, providing to Yapili um, the payments account infrastructure. Uh, as well as the fully automated FX infrastructure. We are integrating the two platforms, so our systems into their product and platform capabilities, and therefore enabling them to go to their own customers with a um, wholesale and, uh, I guess, um, holistic payment solution um, that allows their customers not just to initiate payments, um, but also to store value, uh, to do FX, um, and to really manage the end-to-end -end payment flows better. So, in a way, if you think about it, it's um, moving payments and payment accounts and FX from being uh, a commodity or being a cost center for any business to placing them at the forefront as a driver of revenue and driver of growth for someone like, like Yapili. So, again, uh, I think these are the first, maybe baby steps for some would say, but the first steps in embedded finance. Right, excellent. Now, um, just finishing off, um, Jana, in, in terms of you know, the future, the evolution of payments, what are you seeing there? That's, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think, you know, there is this disconnect between um, all of us here on the floor in Money 2020 and then uh, when you step out of the industry and talk to businesses. And the reason why I'm saying this is because here we tend to talk about payments, about embedded finance, um, but ultimately businesses are focused on solving customer problems, improving customer experience and, uh, and driving growth. And they don't really think about embedded finance in the, uh, the terms that we use, they don't really label this. But they're looking, to solve uh, they're looking to solve problems and they're looking for solutions. So I think the future of payments is really becoming a solution for businesses and becoming an enabler for growth. And this is what I, I, I would very much like, like to see. So using the payments infrastructure to drive better automation, to drive better customer experience, and ultimately to drive uh, growth in, in the wider economy. Jana Dimitreva, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, pleasure. So next up, um, Andrew Considine, uh, VP, Head of SMB and Clover Amir at uh, Fiserv. Andrew, let's start with a quick introduction to your company. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, so great to be here. Uh, so Fiserv provides technology uh, to the financial services industry, so everything from small to medium businesses to enterprise and also to financial institutions as well. So US headquartered company, but we work worldwide. Great. And uh, we've asked a few of our guests this. Anything in particular that you're hoping to see here at Money 2020 this year? Yeah, so meeting partners and, and also clients as well. But I think probably like a lot of people looking to see what's coming next, right? We've talked a lot about the pandemic and the, the impact on the industry and technology. And I think everybody's kind of planning for what the next kind of years will bring. So it's interesting to see there's a plethora of companies here. It's interesting to see what's coming next from all of them. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna pick you up on that then. Yep. In terms of what do you see as the key trends kind of in um, the whole fintech e-commerce payments area? Yeah, so, so we, we operate heavily in the payment space. Uh, you know, everything from merchants that are running cafes and restaurants all the way through to big enterprises. Um, I think what we're seeing is there's been a change in consumer behavior from a payments perspective, obviously driven by the pandemic. And what we're seeing is that behavioral change is, is coming through beyond the pandemic as well. So I think what we're seeing is a consumer expectation of being able to pay anywhere, through any channel, any, anyhow, any way they like. 
Um, and so by providing the technology to make that make that feasible, that's really where Fiserv is playing at the moment. And so whether it's online or whether it's card present, you know, there's a lot of talk around the conference here around the internet economy and you know the companies that are working in that space. But there's still a, you know a, a big payments uh, presence and card present. You know people in shops and physical locations. So the link between those two and making that a seamless experience, whether you're a, a consumer paying for a coffee or somebody buying uh, you know food from a from a fast food restaurant. Uh, all the way through to making payments for, for you know large services and large products as well. So it should be a seamless and kind of simple experience for everybody. And what about when it comes to omni-channel commerce? Any particular challenges that you're seeing there? Yeah, I think you know it's interesting. And the industry is still talking about data. You know, it's amazing. The ten years on, the challenges are still there, yeah, right? And course, yeah. and it's only getting more so as well. So I think as the industry opens up, and you know, we're talking about ecosystems and interoperability, and you know, companies working together and becoming more open. I think the data kind of challenges just increase with that as well. So, you know, whether you're a small merchant or whether you're a large enterprise, you know, some of those data challenges can be common the whole way through. So, so I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, and then really the customer experience side of things. Again, we're still talking about that 10, 15, 20 years on, right? And and again, as the kind of more platforms integrate, it becomes more open. It's harder to share the data and it's harder to provide a kind of seamless experience for consumers. And so consumers are expecting to be able to, like I said before, pay anywhere, pay any time, but at the same time be treated as an individual. So you know, companies, in the, whether it's e-commerce or whether it's you know, in a physical location, that linking of data and customer experience is going to be one of the key challenges going forward. Right. Now, um, you uh, or, or Fiserv recently announced a partnership with ExxonMobil um, to enable people to pay for petrol using Alexa, which I'm really intrigued about. Tell us about that. Yeah, so and we're going to see more and more innovation coming out like yeah. that. And it goes again towards kind of moving beyond payments, but then you know allowing payments from anywhere. And as we see the kind of paradigm shifting of you know people paying for you know EV cars or services for those cars as well. You know, and that could be in the vehicle itself or at a charging point or in a shop or location. And linking the data between all three of those experiences is one of the key things we're building with, you know, with, with that partnership. Um, we're going to see more and more innovation coming out this year. So um, we've just recently or had recently announced at the Apple uh, Worldwide Developer Conference this week that um, we're, we're partnering with Apple on the tap to pay capability with iOS. So we're going to be launching our soft pause capabilities with Clover in the SMB space. Um, and then we'll see more and more kind of connected data uh, and payments capabilities across the industry. So you know, Apple will be one. We, we partner with companies all over the world to enable uh, things like cross-border payments, whether it's digital uh, or supplier payments uh, all over the world. And, and that's kind of what a company like Fiserv and what we offer is having that breadth of global coverage means that we can you know, partner with people and bring them into the ecosystem to enable payments anywhere, anytime. Okay, and something else you also uh, recently launched, which was um, Carrot. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about the, the thinking behind that. Yeah, so, so Carrot was, um, it's our enterprise brand, and really the whole thinking behind Carrot is to provide an operating system for the enterprise world. Um, and so again, the ability to be able to hook into a single platform uh, with common interfaces and integrations, a common data stack, and all of the you know, areas like risk and compliance and security and fraud management all controlled within one environment allows enterprises to be able to hook into that, into that platform and benefit from a company of the size of Pfizer. So um, you know, everything from companies in the retail space to uh, into the kind of restaurant space, into the franchise space, um, coming into a single platform means that whether they're operating in Spain or in the US or the UK or Australia, it's a common platform that operates worldwide. So Carrot was really set up to be the operating system of the financial industry for, for enterprises. Good stuff. Uh, listen, thank you so much for, for joining us. We got, we got through quite a lot very quickly there, but and, uh, for now, Andrew, uh, Constantine, th uh, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Russ. So I'm now joined by Mariana Gomez de la Villa, uh, Centre Expertise Lead uh, for Distributed Ledger at ING. Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Um, quick introduction to the company. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Russell, for the invitation. And uh, I actually work for ING. ING is a financial institution, it's a bank, uh, headquarters in the Netherlands. But we obviously have also a, a wholesale and retail business. A wholesale business, it's across the globe. And, uh, and in, in a few countries as well, we have uh, some quite some business uh, in retail. Yeah. Now, you spoke um, at the conference yesterday on two sessions, so a busy day for you. Um, let's take each in turn. The first was titled Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow. Do you want to just talk through what was discussed and also what needs to happen in, in banking and financial services to ensure this equality? Yeah. 
Well, uh, I was really pleased to be invited to that panel specifically because obviously I'm a woman and I'm a woman in technology. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm also Mexican. So <laughs> then that means that it's like a double minority sometimes, you know, it can be seen as. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand as well, uh, I realize how lucky I am to work for, for, for a Dutch bank, you know, ING. Um, we have a specific targets with regards to uh, yeah, diversity and inclusion. And we look at diversity not only for the point of view from, you know, whether you are a, a female or a male, but uh, as well we look at uh, diversity and inclusion from the point of view that you need to have 70%, for example, of the team uh, could be from the same gender, but also from the same age group or from the same nationality or background, right? That means that normally, for example, you would need at least three people in a, in a group of 10, so the other 30%, that needs to be from a different gender, from a different group of age, or from a different uh, background in order to really change the conversation, to really influence a little bit more, you know, towards, towards a, a more, yeah, a better target, let's say. And uh, we have seen that uh, by having, for example, these targets, teams actually improve a lot in the, in the way they make decisions. They are more inventive. And when you actually feel supported and feel empowered, you know, you thrive. And when you are free to be yourself as well, it's, it's, it's a better way to reach actually your purpose, right? Which is one of the, of the Think Forward strategies from, uh, from ING, one of the points of, the, of our strategy. So then, um, yeah, having realized how advanced we are in that sense, uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion, make me feel really proud. Uh, I also see it obviously not only at my level of what I do uh, another day today, but I also see it on the board, right? In the board, we have as well female colleagues that are also uh, different colleagues that are from a different cultural background. Uh, so you start seeing obviously that, that we're applying uh, those th and, and, and achieving those objectives and principles. There's a lot to happen still, I think, in the financial industry as a whole. So not only in tech, but as well, you know, in, in certain institutions, in the payments industry, uh, such as, for example, what we're seeing right now, you see a huge amount of, uh, of, of male uh, uh, being here. But I think we're on the right path, and uh, and I realized that as well yesterday. So it well, made me feel really nice. Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting you say that because you only have to look around the room and, and you do <laughs> see that. But what was the feeling in the session? To, to, to Obviously, you're proud of what you're achieving at ING, but other people in the room, do, do they feel the industry is moving quickly enough? Uh, I think there's still some struggles indeed, uh, but but the fact that you could actually pinpoint, right, and, 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 and be at a level of, uh, you know, having part of that decision making, uh, yeah, it, 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 it gives you a lot of uh, uh, room to play. For example, in that session, I also mentioned a few of the things that I'm doing myself uh, with my team. You can imagine as being technologies, right? Uh, sometimes you want to share the knowledge that you gather throughout experimentation and the learnings that you have achieved. And we share them with a wider audience. Uh, we publish, for example, white papers. And a lot of the times you also have these biases in academia. So it's not only the financial industry or the payments industry, it's academia as well. A little bit of bias, right? There's, uh, there's there. So uh, we have implemented certain type of policies. Like for example, uh, whenever we publish uh, white papers, we make sure that you don't add your full name, but you just add your initial, like M in this case, and then the last name, you know, Gomez de la Villa. So then people wouldn't know if you're a female or a male, and then they would quote you, because we have seen as well from research that when you are a woman, uh, you are less likely to be quoted by 10 times, right? So then in this case, uh, applying those kind of things, you know, whatever is in your power, and as little as it might seem, it already starts changing things, and, and not only things within your team, but things on, you know, you start also permeating those type of ideas to wider uh, uh, colleagues, for example, within your own institution, and then it starts growing more in the ecosystem, etc. Yeah, right? Yeah. Another thing that, uh, that I think was uh, uh, quite unique, at least from, from my perspective, is the fact that we have decentralized autonomous organizations in the blockchain industry. And these DAOs, right, are also a, a mechanisms where you can actually vote for a proposal of something happening within that ecosystem, right? Whether that's a code change, whether that's an upgrade, whether that's an, an update, any, any, anything needs to happen, it, it's voted upon. Yeah. But it is voted upon pseudonymity. So people is pseudonymous in these organizations and it doesn't matter which age you are, where are you coming from, where are you located, uh, you know, which gender do you do you have? It doesn't matter anything because you are pseudonymous. So then they don't know these items from you, and then you can just propose 
a change and then they might vote only on your contribution. So it's really content related, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I'm happy to see that at least this industry, where I'm really lucky to be in, which is a blockchain industry, then is moving ahead uh, with gender bias, diversity yeah. and inclusion. Yeah. Clearly an area that you are very passionate about, because it's coming <laughs> through and it's great. It's, no, honestly, it's, it's great to hear. Now, your second session uh, yesterday was on moving the regulated market to DLT, so distributed ledger technology. Um, how are financial institutions being challenged by their clients now in, in terms of new technology? Well, uh, I think we have always been challenged by clients, right? Uh, otherwise, you cannot improve. So yeah. that's the, that's a given. Uh, and we, we see a lot of opportunities as well because we are a customer-centric uh, organization, right? So you, you look at CX, uh, customer experience, uh, we have accommodated or organized ourselves around that as well. So we have, uh, you know, instead of product managers, we have uh, what we call uh, journey expert, customer journey experts, and they map the journey and then they see actually where are friction points. Uh, as you can imagine, obviously, in the area of, 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 of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, the metaverse and all these Web3-like uh, uh, type of, you know, layers uh, that you may have in this ecosystem, there are a lot of friction points. So there's a lot for us to do, right? And one of those friction points could be, for example, seen as regulation. Then you have as well the other side from DLT, this related technology per se, you know, that is regulated. So when you tokenize a real life asset, such as a bond or such as a security, and you put it on the blockchain, that is already regulated. You can already do that, right, for a really long time. We have done so as well, for example, in trade finance, we have done so in, in other use cases. So, so those are, um, yeah, the regulatory aspects uh, uh, are already considered. So you make a compliant, uh, uh, yeah, by design type of solution, right? I guess that the, the question is more the, the part of the ecosystem which is not 100% regulated yet, uh, but I think we're going that way. We have obviously, uh, yeah, the, the, the oversight of the European Union, the European Central Bank, which are looking into these mechanisms, such as creating, for example, uh, MICAR, such as uh, the, the, the EU as well, doing some experimentation uh, by utilizing DLT in a lot of different uh, aspects in the infrastructure actually, and as well, for example, we see it on the central bank digital currency uh, uh, topic, right? right. So uh, it's, it's getting there. Any yeah. other risks that exist that need to be overcome? Well, risks on, on the segments of the market which are not regulated, for example, decentralized finance, for example, cryptocurrencies, there obviously are a lot of risks. Uh, there are risks because there's no consumer protection and, and, and obviously, uh, you know, financial institutions need to ensure that, uh, that, yeah, whenever you provide services, those services are at pair with uh, your regulation, right, that you have to appeal, whether that's retail, wholesale, whatever it is. Um, so, so the risk is obviously, uh, yeah, that, that, that your customers might be scammed in one of these markets uh, or that may, they might have investments, you know, that are not actually, uh, uh, yeah, properly provided on a, on a later stage, etc. But uh, but yeah, that that is that consumer protection, that that uh, 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 yeah, duty of care that we have as financial institutions is exactly the the one that is dictating our compass, right? And is ensuring that whatever we do, whatever experimentation we do, it's follow uh, with our ethos and with our uh, values. Uh, and, and, and we are, yeah, in everything we do, we need to follow that regulation. We need to ensure that we are protecting our customers. Where we have to ensure that we are protecting the financial ecosystem because we're a systemic institution. So, uh, yeah, there's no turning around. And then, just to finish off then, any other emerging technologies that you're focusing on at, at ING? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, now uh, it's, it's this era where uh, you have seen, obviously, uh, this related technology or blockchains, you know, being there for, for a decade, uh, over a decade right. by now. So what we're starting to see that is really interesting is other technologies such as machine learning, such as artificial intelligence or quantum being merged, right? So complementing actually the solutions that we are uh, deploying in production. So for example, there, there has been also as well this advancement, let's say in quantum, uh, and now you are starting to see, you know, people experimenting with making quantum resistant protocols, right? Or for example, having a machine learning algorithms that are uh, put to make better decisions and then those decisions being recorded on the blockchain and then feeding back again, you know, uh, uh, another decision making protocol and then going back into, into the blockchain, etc. So uh, you start seeing how they indeed start complementing each other, how you can plug and play with them and then see uh, which other 
parts of your journey towards your customer may be improved by connecting the dots. Fascinating stuff. I'm sure we could talk for a long time, yeah. but Mariana, for now, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we're now joined by uh, Daniel Shellen, CEO of Tink. Uh, Daniel, thanks for joining the podcast. Do you want to just start with a very quick introduction to Tink? Hi, and, and thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah, so Tink is a European open banking platform um, where we stitch together some three and a half thousand banks uh, into one platform. And on top of that, we, um, we build products to help our customers who are always financial institutions to get the most out of this underlying infrastructure, uh, both to aggregate data uh, and also to make payments. Yesterday at the uh, at Money 2020 here, you sat down with Charlotte Hogg, CEO of Europe at, at Visa for your session. I want to ask you about the session in a second, but do you still have to pinch yourself that you're now part of that company? I mean, to be honest, I think one of the, 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 the perks or the curse of being an entrepreneur is that you have, uh, you always believe in yourself and think that you're, you're on the verge of, of doing something amazing. Um, so we've always felt that we deserved to be part of, of a great organization like, like Visa or to remain independent. But yes, obviously we are super proud. I, I, we've been venture backed for the past 10 years. Uh, which has served us great when you, know, you need to do the trial and error and all of that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's pretty clear now that we want to be the global open banking platform. We want to power the pioneers. We want to give everyone access to this amazing infrastructure which is, is based on people's bank account uh, because we think it's going to increase competition, innovation uh, and eventually consumer choice. Um, and I couldn't really find a better home um, in order to achieve that, that uh, vision and, and dream than Visa. Uh, being a global company, having seen firsthand uh, the upside of building financial infrastructure and, and how that can benefit individuals and societies and businesses if you get it right, that it can take time to build it yeah. um, and have the stamina to do it but also have the brand and the, the global organization. It's, sure. it's, uh, it's a perfect place to be. Why did Visa decide to buy Tink? And also, why did you agree to the acquisition? Well, so we've been out of and in, in and out of fashion for the past 10 years. Sometimes it's been the cool thing, and certainly we've been like absolutely not cool. Past few years, we've, we've been fortunate enough to have some people come knock on our doors, and we've always evaluated this with the same lens like is this going to increase the likelihood of us uh, being able to be the global open banking platform uh, and the answer previously was no and the answer now was yes I think that we met a team at Visa that uh, both culturally had a match with us and I think that was important on both sides that had set high bars for themselves big ambitions um, but as I said before I think that they've also seen firsthand um, the enormous potential if you have the stamina to build out a global payment network um, or in this case a, an open banking network and, and the upsides that comes both from a business perspective but also then also from a consumer and societies. So what do you think now that, that you are together, you know, what, what's this going to enable both parties to do in the future? I think for us we, we can have a slightly long, more long term uh, horizon we can probably go global faster than we could have done uh, otherwise. Um, you can say that, that um, you're being independent, uh, but it's also that you rely on, on your investors to continue to invest in you. Um, and uh, I think that with, with Visa, we have a slightly more long-term horizon. Well, but also to leverage their organization and knowing about cybersecurity, how to build trust, and also their I mean, I think that every single customer that we want to work with is probably an existing customer of Visa today. So, And, and what message do you think it sends to the rest of the industry? I think it's a little bit of, of testament uh, to that this is an important movement uh, and uh, uh, that Visa wants to continue to in, in invest in, in, in this uh, platform. Okay. Now, I just want to finish off the, um, with a announcement that uh, you guys have made here at Money 2020, which is a new European payment partnership with Revolut. Tell us about that. Well, it's so exciting because, I mean, we, we take pride of, uh, in doing the boring, heavy lifting, the plumbing, if, if you want. Um, and we say we want to power the pioneers, and they might be everywhere. They might be the two-man band in the garage, uh, the scale-ups at Revolut, or, um, or even the big banks, traditional banks. 
but but truth be told there will be only be a handful in the banking segment that has both the scale uh, the capacity to innovate uh, to bring new products um, and processes to the market and uh, where everyone else would look and say, and I want to be a follower, to be, to be honest. And Revolut will be one of those. Uh, they will also be one of the most picky partner-selecting processes you'll ever see. So I think all of these things combined makes us very, very proud partners of Revolut. Fantastic. Well, exciting times for, uh, for you guys. But for now, Daniel and Shannon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. So I'm here with uh, Joanne Dewar, CEO of Global Processing Services. Um, very late in the day, so thank you, uh, Joanne, for joining us. Do you want to start by just giving us a quick intro to your company? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Global Processing Services, or GPS, we are an issuer processor, which means we're the, uh, the technology behind the card payments processing for many of the, uh, the world's leading uh, fintechs, challenger banks, and uh, digital banks, such as uh, Revolut, Starling, Curve, and, and many others around the world. Great. Uh, now, you were in a session uh, today about the rise of the orchestration layer. So, my first question has to be, explain what an orchestration layer is. A, an orchestration layer is really a technology layer that sits uh, in an organization to help manage the many dependencies and many integrations that an organization uh, needs to have in order to be able to manage a program. The fintech ecosystem is extraordinarily complex. Even when you're working in one market, you need uh, maybe eight or more different partners in order to be able to uh, bring a program to life. When you are then building out capability across multiple markets in multiple geographies, uh, very often those partners you know, cannot provide the support across all the geographies, so you need a more variety of partners. Uh, so you can either be in a position of having lots and lots of point-to-point -point integrations, which creates like a, a spaghetti matrix of, of integrations, or you can put an orchestration layer in the middle, which enables you to have point-to-point uh, -point, um, uh, integrations that are more simple to, uh, to manage, to support, uh, to, to bring other players in, um, or, or ultimately to upgrade over time. And, and what was the key takeaway from that session? So we were looking in the session about both the merchant acquiring side and the issuing side, and we concluded that thematically the issues are, the challenges and the opportunities are exactly the same. Uh, so certainly from the, the issuing side, uh, the types of benefit, uh, it's easiest to be able to describe by giving you a, a, a real example. In our relationship uh, with Revolut, we've been able to support them uh, to gain uh, scale at speed and uh, efficiently from a cost perspective. And so we've been able to support them in going live in 42 different countries with 10 different card manufacturers, with four different issuing banks, with two schemes uh, in three continents, all running on a single API integration, a single interface into us. So that enables them to provide a single uh, user experience, uh, a single you know, mobile app-based experience uh, consistently, uh, globally, uh, without having had to uh, develop lots and lots of different integrations. That really is pretty special, it's pretty unique. Uh, it's enabled them to scale uh, geographically very quickly uh, without having a uh, huge cost. And uh, you know, they're able to, to leverage the advantages of having uh, multiple uh, partners and multiple suppliers, whether it's from a resiliency perspective or also uh, a cost management perspective as well. Why, why has there been such um, transformation in the payments ecosystem you know, in recent years? I think it's ultimately it's, it's uh, customer demand, whether right. it's customers or the consumers or, or businesses. Uh, there is uh, a, you know, a, a clear drive to move away from cash. There's a, a generation that is expecting everything can be done in an instant. Everyone's got a, you know, a mobile phone. They're expecting that their relationship with their bank can be you know, instant and available at the touch of a button. And one of the things that's been you know, really apparent through the, the pandemic is it's the same experience in every geography across the world. And if anything, there's been a, you know, an acceleration. I mean, who would have imagined that you'd have the World Health Organization saying we recommend you move away from cash and use digital banking experiences? So you know, there's, there's been this sort of 
huge acceleration uh, at the same time across the world and uh, that creates huge opportunities for yeah. us. And you, me you mentioned how many countries you know, you're working with uh, Revolu in, in. I mean, for, for other businesses entering global markets, what, what challenges exist and, and how are they going to be overcome? So the, the, the challenges are really that um, when you're working with uh, a regulated entity, there is jurisdiction boundaries. And, I, and, and most of the, the fintechs in the world, they, they want, they're thinking uh, big, they're thinking beyond uh, national boundaries. They've got, you know, all got ambitions for global domination. Um, and in order to be able to provide a, an offering across multiple markets, you need to find multiple service providers, whether it's uh, the issuing bank, whether it's a KYC provider, um, whether it's card manufacturer, and so you need to pull together that, uh, you know, that collaboration of an ecosystem uh, for each market that you're going into. Now, we've been really um, uh, fortunate in, in Europe to date, if we put Brexit to one side, uh, in that we've had the separate agreement, which means that you can access all the markets across uh, the, uh, the single European payments area uh, whilst being uh, you know, uh, registered in one market and then passporting that license across. And that's really why uh, originally so many of uh, fintechs uh, started in, in the UK, uh, where we had a very supportive uh, regulator and they were able to passport that out. When you start to look outside uh, Europe into uh, Asia Pac or, or MENA or other geographies, actually you need to grow on a well, you need to build out your capabilities and your, your licensing on a market by market basis, which means that you know for each country you're needing to find the partners to be able to support. What an organisation like GPS does is help navigate that complexity because, it, as in the case of Revolut, single integration with us, that's the technical part taken care of, and then you can just find uh, the, the, you know, the issuing relationships and the, the contractual relationships that you need to be able to spur service that market. Joan Dewar, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. So I'm now with uh, Tio Blidaris, uh, CEO and co-founder of Fintech OS. Tio, thanks uh, for joining us. Shall we start with thank a you. very quick intro to your business? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we started four and a half years ago with this uh, crazy idea that every company is becoming a Fintech company. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess now looking at the present moment, I think it's really, really happening. Uh, and we're uh, effectively helping, uh, our, our job is to help any company launch uh, better, faster, cheaper financial services and products into the market. Brilliant. We're working with banks, we're working with insurers, uh, we're working with retailers, e-commerce, telcos, infrastructure players, so everybody is becoming a fintech company and we are pretty much in, that, in this motion. And in, and in terms of that, I mean, you, you know, just wandering around uh, Money 2020, um, you know, over the last couple of days, and, and you know, what, what have you seen? Any trends that, that are sort of like highlighted for you? Uh, I think it's it's pretty obvious that the trend of the of the show is anything linked with embedded finance, from you know embedded pay payments to you know BMPL, even embedded insurance, and uh, as I said, we're we're also very much in the middle of that. I think uh, with uh, the you know. Apple Pay Later uh, happening and with us showcasing for example here our uh, Buy Now Pay Later accelerators in various uh, business models that we've deployed across uh, Europe and UK. I think it's, uh, it's obviously um, you know, the, the embedded finance I would say it's the topic. Now you're speaking on a session tomorrow around open source tomorrow yeah. is, is what it's called. Um, can you give us a little preview on what you're going to be talking about? Any sort of like key highlights that you can share? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I think open source has, has become a, you know, a source of innovation for, uh, for the banking sector. Uh, we at Fintech OS, we also contribute to open source, but we also embed and work you know, with open source technologies. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of a panel. I have two open source specialists in the panel that are very enthusiastic about it. I'll try to be a little bit more controversial around certain areas. I'd like to bring the, the topic from open source more towards open innovation, as in, right, so the open source, it's interesting, is accelerating, is producing best of breed, 
but how are we actually enable more people to innovate, right? And this is where, for example, our strategies around you know no code, low code, and you know offering composable build, building blocks that are pre-built and you can easily you know orchestrate in order to build best of breed financial products and services. I will be pushing more into that direction as a broader. Uh, topic rather right. than just open source. Okay, and, and what, what do you think banking and, and financial uh, service companies need to be mindful of when they're embarking on you know their, their journey of digital transformation? Well, I think uh, I, I would frame it uh, in a in a couple of simple sentences. So the the most important thing is that nobody wants to buy a mortgage, right? Everybody wants to buy a house. And you know this is where our our focus collectively as a, as an ecosystem of uh, you know financial services infrastructure should be, mm. and and yes sure uh, you know the house brings together a mortgage uh, probably a term life uh, you know insurance and a refurbishment loan and uh, I don't know a, a household uh, protection and even a pet insurance if if you're you know if you're a pet lover. Yep. But I think um, you know the, the main idea here is that customers are looking uh, for ambient financial services, personalized, differentiated, and I think there's a huge opportunity for the whole ecosystem. You know the traditional incumbents, but also the newer players to to participate in that. Customers are also looking for end-to-end -end customer digital journeys rather than not only you know the tip of the iceberg. And I think looking at uh, you know the digital customer experience, but coupling it with um, you know better personalized products and lean core operations, it's a win-win-win. Right. Because um, at the end of the day, customers are happier, uh, but also the you know the financial institutions are being able to uh, to drive more efficiency, which is, as we know, very very important today. Yeah. Now, now one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is, is a recent announcement that um, that you at, uh, at FinTech OS uh, made, is that, and, and that's that you've been selected for PwC and Microsoft's digital banking solution. Um, tell us a little bit about that collaboration. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's it's a fantastic achievement for a company like ours, who is 40 years old in, into a, quite a mature market and being um, effectively backed up by you know two of the largest. Uh, if not the largest institutions who are playing here, you know, a tier one consulting company like PwC and, and uh, you know, arguably the, the most important technology provider. Um, so I think everybody understands that at this point, um, when we're talking about digital banking services, uh, just having an, an off-the-shelf solution, maybe cloud-based, um, you know, off the shelf solution is not good enough. Right? Mm -hmm. So what PwC has been uh, looking after, he has been looking for uh, what we call a fintech infrastructure as a service. So an infrastructure that is uh, very flexible, uh, that it can be operated through no code, low code, to be able to empower people to do more, to innovate faster. Uh, a technology that is composable, so they can effectively tailor uh, the infrastructure to suit uh, the you know the reality of the customers. So and some customers might have a gap in their innovation in core processes. Some of them would would have gap of innovation in you know customer journeys. And fintech OS is that glue in the middle that helps uh, PwC and Microsoft orchestrate best of breed you know fintech um, partnerships. Is it a good indication of where the business is going? I think it's a it's a tremendous. Um, you know, endorsement for us. Yeah. Uh, we've been uh, selected, and we're working with uh, you know other tier one consulting uh, companies. And I think uh, everybody understands that in, in the world where every company is a fintech company, there's a there's a new category of, of technology that uh, has to dwell on both flexibility and, and cost efficiency, but also starts from the customer perspective when designing financial services. And this is where we think FinTech OS can, can really play a, a, a real great part. Yeah, well congratulations on that on that um, uh, sort of collaboration and um, you know, best of luck with developing all that. But for now, Tio, thank, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much as well. So I'm here with uh, Roger uh, Gauter, uh, Chief Product Officer of Molly. Um, Roger, let's start with a quick introduction to the company. Cool, thanks Russell. 
So yeah, Molly is an online payments company headquartered here in Amsterdam, uh, active in uh, seven European markets and serving over 150,000 uh, uh, retailers and customers. Now, um, you were taking part in a session uh, today and that was all about your new partnership with Plaid. Um, tell us a little bit more about that and what it means for both companies. Yeah. So Molly is using uh, Plaid's open banking APIs to further improve the onboarding experience of our customers. So as a regulated institution, uh, we need to, of course, perform the necessary checks before our customer can go live. Molly has always been very true at making that process as seamless as possible. And using Platt's technology, we can now make that process uh, real time instead of uh, having this take a couple of days. So we're really exciting about that. Um, for us, it means a better experience for our customers. For Platt, it, of course, means uh, partnering with one of the leading uh, European fintechs and uh, proving value with, uh, with open banking, which is uh, slowly starting to happen in the industry. And um, um, what, what precedent would you say this uh, partnership sets for, for Molly and also for the industry as a whole? I think for Molly it's really about uh, building yourself what is core to the business, right? Uh, we know really well what we're good at. It's our online payments products, making sure that we deliver the best value to our, uh, to our customers. But also really being conscious that there's many companies out there with specialism and great technologies. Uh, and be a bit uh, conscious around what do you build yourself versus where you partner in the interest of your customers. So I think the, in the precedent for the industry will be that hopefully we're going to see a little bit more partnerships that actually deliver value for customers as opposed to companies trying to build it all themselves and not deliver a compatible solution for, for their customers. Yeah, so, I was, I was going to ask, would, would you say these kind of partnerships are part of your wider strategy then moving forward? Well, absolutely. I think that, uh, again, we want to give an integrated experience for our customers so they don't necessarily have to see those uh, partnerships. And for them, it's, it's only delivering the front-facing product solution. But at the end, it's around delivering the best value and best products for your customers. And partnerships are absolutely a part of that, especially if you look at the speed of innovation here in the fintech industry. You will need to partner with uh, the best specialists in order to deliver a complete product to your right. customers. Um, I want to ask you about the market in general, fintech stocks are down considerably this yeah. year. What, what, what are your thoughts about this and how is Molly placed to withstand that kind of volatility in the space? Yeah. Molly is very fortunate that we have a very viable business that's growing really, really rapidly. So we have a proven business model. So in that sense, uh, we're in that sense very, very lucky. What you will see though is uh, a year ago you could raise money based on an idea without having a product, right? Yeah. And that is now really, really changing. And I think there's more pressure on delivering value for customers and having viability into the core offering, which really is to our advantage, right? Because we have a viable offering, we're growing really rapidly, and uh, yeah, we're levering the best technologies uh, in order to deliver value for our customers. So, so yeah, it's uh, in that sense, uh, it's some uh, uh, more humility in the fintech industry is good, and uh, we really support it. Great. And any other trends that you're seeing, you know, in, in, in the sector in general, and, and also how do you see the you know the whole fintech sector evolving? Yeah. Uh, a couple of things, like what we see in online payments is that uh, the use of payment types by consumers across our different markets is actually rapidly changing. Last year it was the year of buy now, pay later, it grew over 180% um, within our portfolio. And we see new trends coming up in all the different markets, so the next generation of bank payments is, is already starting to emerge here in the Netherlands, so that's certainly one trend. A second piece that we're uh, uh, really observing is that the lines between offline and online payments is blurring. Mm. Uh, during the pandemic, but also with the employee shortages that you see across the sector, we suddenly see Molly being used at all kinds of physical locations that deal with employee shortages, which is really, really interesting. And we foresee a future of uh, software-based uh, point of sale system. And three, I think you, you see more uh, partnerships as opposed to the conception of building this single operating system without choice for SMBs. There are some companies trying to do just that, but we believe that SMBs uh, want their services to be compatible. They want their accounting, tax, and financial services software and payment software to work together. Uh, and they don't necessarily care about who serves that, they care about having the best product. So we'll foresee more partnerships and uh, they get compatibility between those uh, services and uh, as opposed to the single stop shop that builds it all. Sure, great stuff. Uh, listen, Roger, I'd love to talk to uh, you more, but I know we've got a busy schedule, so for now, thanks for joining us. Great, Russell. Appreciate the time. Cheers. Great, uh, great being here.
Well, that wraps up this uh, second episode that we've recorded at Money 2020 Europe. So thanks again to all my guests who took the time to chat with me today. And of course, to the team at Banking Circle for partnering with us and hosting us on their booth. Uh, we hope you've got a lot out of both the episodes that we've recorded here. We'd love to hear any comments you may have on any of the topics we've covered. So if you'd like to contribute, you can do that uh, on our Facebook page, Twitter feed, our YouTube channel, uh, LinkedIn and Instagram pages. They're all linked from the top of the website at csuitepodcast.com, uh, where you'll also find links to all our previous shows and supporting show notes plus links to where you can uh, follow the podcast uh, for automatic downloads of each episode via your favorite podcast app and if you've enjoyed the show um please do give us a positive rating and review. Finally, if you would like to get in touch with the show, uh, you can do that via the contact form on the website as well, or you can connect with me on Twitter using at Russ Goldsmith, or you can find me on LinkedIn. But for now, thanks for listening and goodbye.